Good morning. I think I'm on. Yep, I'm on. I'm good. All right, wonderful. It's uh, good to be with you as always, and uh, what a wonderful time of worship through song. Uh, praise God for the work that He's doing here at Rikers Ridge, and it's a privilege to join our voices together uh, with the, the saints and sing the praises of God. What a glorious sound that was. Uh, really joyous uh, sneak preview of uh, when we're going to be with the Lord. I, I just, what a glorious time. Let me, uh, let me usher us just very briefly into our Thanksgiving season with a few things, some of which have already been stressed this morning, but I'll add my two cents uh, to give thanks for a few things. Um, as a reminder, Brother Holly brought the announcements this morning. We are uh, celebrating as a church with our uh, church-wide Thanksgiving dinner this evening at 5 p.m., and we are taking a, a, a special offering, Brother Rob spoke of that a couple weeks ago, a benevolence offering. It's a way for us to, uh, in a tangible way, give thanks. There are a, a lot of needs uh, that, that come up from time to time, and this is a way for us to help provide for some needs that come to our attention as a church. So again, we'll be taking a benevolence offering, much like we did, it's probably been four or five years ago since we've done that, when we used to run the food pantry uh, we would use the Thanksgiving dinner for this. Again, it's a tangible way for us to give thanks. Also want to uh, express my appreciation, my own thanks for those who labored f to make the family conference happen last weekend. Um, there were many hands involved in that, um, everything from uh, preparing meals, uh, so wonderfully led by our sister Heidi and uh, Carol and, and me and others, uh, Colleen, and then... Um, uh, others who spoke and who prepared things, those people taught children, my, my own uh, children being, or at least one of them as a part of that. It takes a lot of work to pull that off, and I want to I say thank you to those who uh, were a part of that. Also, I want to echo what uh, Brother Ho Holly mentioned uh, earlier regarding uh, Thanksgiving for our veterans. Um, there's a reason why we can gather as we do. And if, uh, as I said to Holly earlier, if no one served, um, we take it for granted that we can do this. Uh, how many places, we, we prayed this morning for the persecuted church, and I've been places in the world where this, what we're doing right now, is not possible. And God is so gracious to us to allow that. So if you've served in our armed forces, uh, you have my thanks as well for this. And we praise God for the freedoms that we have. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, as we often do here. We have 60 seconds of silent prayer. Um, pretty rare that we have 60 seconds of silent anything in our world today. So let's take this opportunity to give thanks. We have much to be thankful for. So let's give thanks to the Lord during this time of silent prayer, and then I'll kick off the sermon. Our gracious Father, we have so much to be thankful for. Those things that we would immediately name the gospel, your son, the church, your word, even uh, material blessings in our own lives. 
But Lord, help us to see and to be thankful even for those things that don't immediately come to mind when we think of things to be thankful for. Lord, we thank you even for times of hardship and suffering. Because those things you use quite often to shape and mold us and conform our our character to that of Christ. Lord, we ask now that you'd focus our hearts and minds together. Give us ears to hear your word today. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Let me tell you a little bit about my morning. Uh, I'm sure it was probably similar to many of your mornings. I woke up this morning because an alarm went off on my phone. How many woke up this morning because an alarm went off on your phone? Raise them high, come on. Maybe you got an old, older style clock or whatever. It's actually a rechargeable battery powered computer that can fit in your pocket, but it also serves as an alarm. And so that was how I woke up this morning. When I got up, the temperature in my house was tolerable because my house is climate controlled by an electric heat pump. And so on this specific morning, we used the heat. If it was the summer, we would have had the air conditioning on. I got up, I turned on electric lights in the various rooms that I visited this morning. And so, uh, go to the bathroom, turn a light on, go out in the other room, turn a light on. Then I took a hot shower. Why? Because we have an electric water heater. And then I, later on, retrieved the ingredients, or some of them at least, for my breakfast from an electric refrigerator and cooked on an electric stove top. I drank coffee that was generated by an electric coffee pot. When I got dressed, I put on clothes that had been washed in an electrically powered washing machine and ironed by an electric iron. And then when we were ready, my family and I climbed into, actually this morning, two vehicles, gasoline-powered engines with lots of electrical components, and made our way here to the church building where we are also benefiting from some of those same things that I mentioned. Uh, Electrically powered lights so I can see, don't see so well in dim lighting anymore, Eyes getting a little weaker, but we've got, thankfully, very bright lights. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) I'll go from memory, brother, if we want to go that route. That's good. We'll continue to utilize lots of electrically powered devices this morning to help us and so on. This is what our days are like, are they not? Uh, This is, we're filled with all sorts of Uh, devices, powered devices that we don't even think about until we can't use them, right? That's when you notice that those things are, 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 are part of our everyday lives. Occasionally, the power fails or it goes out for whatever reason. We've seen that recently on the news. A devastating hurricane hit my home state of Florida, and uh, it's knocked not just the power out, knocked buildings off their foundations and all those sorts of things. Outages occur sometimes in the winter here due to ice or uh, storms. Sometimes other parts of the year, car accidents. I've seen that before. Someone will hit a power pole and you lose power from this. Sometimes the power even goes out on a large scale. Uh, Many of you will remember almost two years ago now, February of 2021, the state of Texas was affected by a massive winter outage. And that's a particularly dangerous time to be without power after a winter storm. The bottom line is this. We're very dependent upon the power being on. And it's quite newsworthy then when the power goes out, especially on a large scale. Now in recent weeks, well, go back a couple weeks. last two weeks have been out of Luke, but we're back in Luke's Gospel this morning. Uh, racing towards the end of the current section here in Luke, in chapter 9. And we've seen over the last several sermons in Luke's Gospel that the focus has been on the identity of Jesus. Who is Jesus? Who is this? And much of that uh, focus or discussion has been on the stunning power and authority of Jesus Christ. He's demonstrated over and over and over and over again unparalleled power over things like nature, over demons, over sickness, over death, 
even over the food supply. You remember the feeding of the 5,000. And then we saw that after some of those things took place, that Jesus gathered the 12 apostles together and He sent them out on a training mission of sorts. He said, don't take anything with you. I want you to go out. And He gave them power and authority to uh, not just to preach, but also to work miracles and to cast out demons. But that's just it, isn't it? Ultimately, the power of Jesus working through His disciples, that's a delegated power. That is not something that is in the disciples themselves uh, on their own. It is because Jesus gave them that power and authority. They did amazing things, but Jesus made it clear in John chapter 15, verse 5, that apart from Him, the disciples could do nothing. So John chapter 15 In verse 5, we read this, I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus being the vine. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do anything. No. Apart from me, you can do a few things, but you need me for most of it. No. It's quite clear. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so without Jesus, the power was out. It was a blackout, so to speak. No Jesus, no power. And that's what we're seeing uh, in our text when we get there in just a bit. Uh, It was true of the disciples in that day. It's true of the disciples of Jesus today. Apart from Jesus, His followers can do nothing. Period. Now, over the last three passages of this current section in Luke which covers Jesus' Galilean ministry. And then for the first passage in the next section, which begins to track the road to Jerusalem and Jesus' crucifixion, we're going to see repeated failures of Jesus' disciples. This is one of the reasons why we study through books here, at least as the bulk of our uh, sermons here. We, We work through books because you don't see these patterns if you're not working through portions of Scripture. There's a pattern here. Luke's trying to show us something. He's trying to show us that the disciples, apart from the power of Jesus Christ, will fail. And fail they do. So in our text today, we see a power failure. They they can't do something. The next passage, next week, Lord willing, we'll look at, highlights a failure of understanding. Without Jesus, they're not going to understand. And in the following sermon, the following text there, we see a failure of humility. And then when we get back in Luke's Gospel, when we pick up in the next section, we'll pick up with another failure, this time a failure of compassion. And so Luke intentionally brings these things together because he's trying to show us something. He's trying to show that the disciples were nothing without Christ. They're nothing without Jesus. Now, those things that the disciples were lacking in over those four texts, I named them power, understanding, humility, and compassion. We also need those things if we're going to minister well or even at all in the name of Christ today. We need those those things. And so the lesson, again, that we need to get is that of John 15, 5. You could think of it this way. What we read in John 15, 5 explains the principle. And what we're seeing here in Luke's Gospel is a a backup, if you will, for that concept that the disciples are nothing without Jesus. And the same, of course, is true of us. Now, if you read the book of Acts, you'll see that the disciples did amazing things. But even then, it was only because of Jesus' ongoing ministry through them. It was not because the the apostles were great guys. Oh, they were just wonderful. They had it all together. They had it all figured out. No, they didn't. They had the power of the Spirit of God working in them. And so Christ was at work in His disciples. Now this morning, I'm going to start off by reviewing this passage with you. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to summarize it, and then we're going to focus on the primary lesson. Pretty simple outline today. So let's start off with a summary this morning. Pretty basic. The disciples lacked the power to do what Jesus could. The disciples lacked the power to do what Jesus could. Now this incident in Luke is abbreviated. It's shortened, if you will, from what we see 
in other Gospels, uh, particularly in, in the Mark's Gospel. If you're familiar, how, how many of you guys, are, you ever heard the, uh, the, the, the account from Mark where the Father comes and there's this exchange, Jesus says, how long has this been going on? And the Father explains it and He says, if you can do anything, help. And Jesus says, if you can. And the Father says, oh, I, help my unbelief. Anybody remember that? I know some of you know that. That's not in here. Luke doesn't mention that. Not that it didn't happen, it did happen, but Luke doesn't bring that up uh, in part because what Luke's focus is here, again, is on the failure of the disciples. Now, he's not throwing them under the bus like he didn't like. He just, Luke had this agenda, I don't like the disciples or whatever, so let me just make them look bad, throw them under the bus. That's not what he's doing. He's making a point. Coming off of the power and authority of Jesus highlighted uh, most prominently in the transfiguration that Jesus, the Son of God, literally glowing, if you will, uh, before uh, the disciples and the the voice of the Father uh, declaring Jesus' identity, right on the backside of that, almost immediately afterward, we're seeing that the disciples will be nothing without Him. They will be nothing without Him. So let's look at the passage together briefly. We picked up in verse 37 this morning. And what we're seeing in verse 37 is something that's been, it's quite familiar to us. It should be quite familiar to us in our study of Luke by this point anyway. Whenever Jesus would go somewhere, especially if he would go off on his own, whenever he would come back to where people were, large crowds would gather. The word had gotten out about Jesus. And so when people knew that he was in the area, they would gather together, perhaps to hear him teach perhaps to see a miracle or maybe even to hopefully experience a miracle for themselves. So the crowd gathers. Again, that's no surprise. They come down the mountain after the transfiguration. Peter, John, James, and Jesus, when they come down, it's not like, oh, where is everybody? No, there's actually a lot of people that are gathered there. It says, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. It's also not a surprise then in verses 38 and 39 that someone in the crowd shouts out at Jesus seeking his help. That's not surprising. Now specifically, the, the request for help is because this man has a, a son, his only son, who's being uh, tormented by this unclean spirit or this demon. And so we're seeing uh, the symptoms there named in uh, verse 39. A spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth. And only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. Now commentators point out that the boy's seizures are consistent with those that are experienced by people who have epilepsy. But in no way, I want to clarify a couple errors that could come out of that. In no way should we take away from this text that anyone who has epilepsy is demon-possessed. That would be both incorrect and incredibly hurtful. So that is not what we should take away from this, nor, if you flip it around the other way, should we do what unbelieving scholars do, and they try to look at a text like this through modern eyes and say something like, well, Luke just didn't have the modern knowledge that we have, and so obviously he didn't know about epilepsy. Clearly that's what this boy had, and so he didn't really have a a, a demon. No, Jesus, the, the Son of God, recognizes that this is actually an unclean spirit, and so he casts out the spirit. It, it, so we shouldn't look at this as a, an unbeliever would and say, well, no, this is just um, some sort of scientific condition. Luke you know, is operating from a pre-modern standpoint. You hear that kind of stuff. I know some of you have heard that. Just wait till Easter time and turn on the TV and hear all the people explaining away the resurrection. Uh, you'll see that type of mindset. That's not what's going on here. Clearly, there's something happening to this boy uh, on account of a demon that's giving him these symptoms. Those things are not surprising so far, verses 37 to 39. Verse 40, though, is new in our study of Luke. We have not seen something like this before. At the beginning of chapter 9, we saw that Jesus gave the disciples power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. That's chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, It says, and he called them together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And they used that power on their training mission, on this preaching tour. But now they seem to be 
lacking in power. They were evidently unsuccessful in driving out this demon that was tormenting this boy. So the question then is, why, why the difference? Why was it that just a little while ago when Jesus said, all right, fellas, come together, here's the game plan. Don't take anything with you. Go out. I'm giving you power and authority. Go out and preach in the villages, cast out demons, heal sick people. They, they say, okay. So they go out and they do it, and they have power to do it. Now Jesus goes up the mountain, and clearly they're lacking in that power. So what is the difference? Well, Matthew's gospel gives us a bit more information on this. But it's clearly implied here in Luke that the issue is one of unbelief. The issue is one of unbelief. Verse 41, there's this rebuke. Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. And so, in the other accounts, in Matthew and Mark, you, you might recognize that some of this rebuke is for the crowd, some of it's for the, even the father with his unbelief. But in the context that Luke is doing is giving us here, uh, the, the issue is primarily the, the unbelief of his disciples. The disciples failed to do this, and Jesus' response uh, is, is, is frustration or irritation, however you would word that, uh, based on their inability to deal with the demon. What is the issue? Why is Jesus perturbed. I, I don't know how you word it. I'm trying to be theologically accurate in what I'm saying. He's not, he's not thrilled with what has just happened. And so he doesn't say, wow, that's really nice that they couldn't do that. No, he, he calls them out. And it, it seems to be directed primarily at the disciples here. And yet, in spite of Jesus' displeasure with his disciples, he still shows compassion for the tormented boy uh, and his father. I could see Jesus would not do this, thankfully. But I could see someone, if they were in this, this uh, situation, saying, listen, I'm sorry that you got to bear the brunt of these guys' failures, but it's time for them to learn a lesson. So, sorry, you're going to have to come back another time. Jesus does not do that. Instead, we see in the text uh, that Jesus... Uh, calls the son. He says, bring your son here. So in spite of his displeasure with the disciples, he still compassionately tells the man to bring the son to him. Then verse 42 shows us something that we are, are accustomed to in Luke. The demons are not thrilled to see Jesus. <laughs> That's an understatement. They're not thrilled to see Jesus. You remember what happened when they, the, Jesus was on the boat with the disciples? They, 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 oh, the storm. No, we're dying, Master. We're perishing. And Jesus gets up and he rebukes the, the wind and the waves. Everything calms down. The disciples are like, whoa, who is this? And then they keep going and they're probably like, oh, man, that was crazy. Hopefully nothing else crazy is going to happen today. Bad day for them if that's what they were thinking. Because as soon as the, the boat pulls up on the shore, who meets them? but a, a, a crazy, naked, broken chain guy screaming at him. Ah! That's the day you wish you slept in. But there's no showdown. As I said when I preached that sermon, there's no showdown. There's no, ooh, who's going to win? Jesus or the legion of demons. There's none of that. Jesus says, get out. And they, they, they beg for permission to go into the, the, the herd of swine, and he says, yeah, okay, and then they, they run off the cliff or whatever into the water. But in the end, they're subject to Jesus, much like this. Again, not happy to see Jesus, and so what do we see there? While he was, when he was still approaching, uh, that is the little boy, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. So that's the passage in a nutshell. And the response of the crowd, of course, they were all amazed at the greatness of God. The disciples were only effective when they ministered in the power that Jesus gave them. And when that power was cut off through unbelief, they were helpless to do anything. They needed Jesus in His power if they were going to be useful in serving Christ and serving others around them, which leads us then to our lesson for today. I'm sure you can probably guess it. 
We need Jesus if we are going to minister with power. We need Jesus. We're no different than the disciples. But we're no different at all. We need Jesus. Has anything really changed? I mean, the technology's changed, right? I, the illustration I gave at the beginning of the sermon, the disciples weren't waking up that morning because the alarm went off on their cell phone. I assure you that. And they ate different things, right? They, their, their clothes were different. They weren't wearing uh, things like they were wearing tunics and other stuff. Different clothing, sure. But one thing is absolutely the same, and that is that we are just as dependent on the power of Christ as the disciples were. 100%. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Remember Jesus said that? We will fail in ministry just as the disciples did in our text today if we do not operate with the power of Jesus. Period. He alone deserves all glory. Now I'm speaking in broader terms a bit because the primary issue for us is not one of exorcisms or even healings. We don't have time this morning to dive into a deep discussion on miraculous gifts and their use today. I, I did speak about that when we worked through 1 Corinthians a while back. But the need for Jesus and His power goes far beyond the working of what we see as miracles. My friends, if we are going to make any kingdom impact in this world, period. And by the way, it is a miracle when a, a sinner comes to faith in Christ. That is miraculous. In no way, shape, or form am I discounting that. That is just as, in fact, in some ways, the, the, the hardness of sin and the deceitfulness of sin, the fact that that gets broken when a person comes to faith in Jesus, that's actually in some ways more miraculous than someone be, regaining the ability to walk or speak. Uh, it's it's a, an amazing work of the Spirit of God. If we're going to make a kingdom impact in this world, whether that's as individuals, as families, or as a church family, it's only going to be because of the power of Christ in us through the Holy Spirit. So let's look again at John 15. Uh, again, the principle is laid out in John 15. Here we see examples. So let's look a little bit more at the, co the context of John 15, 5, which I mentioned earlier. Pick up in verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser." Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. And in case you didn't get that, disciples, let me repeat the same message in another form. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. My friends, the larger point there is clear. If the disciples... Do not abide in Christ or stay connected to Him. They won't bear fruit for Him. The power will be out. It's a power outage. How then will the disciples of Jesus remain connected to Him once the ascension takes place? Right? Jesus is not walking the earth with us now like He was in the days of the, the apostles. Jesus literally was there in the flesh with them climbed the Mount of Transfiguration, came down. He, he was standing there with them. That is not the case after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And then He ascends to be at the right hand of the Father. So what are the disciples to do then? And my friends, here is where it helps for us to look at the larger context of John 15. Because if you look at John 15, both before and after that, in chapter 14 and in chapter 16, Jesus speaks about the Helper 
or the Comforter, depending on your translation. The Holy Spirit. And so there's much for us to learn here. John chapter 14, let me give you an example. John chapter 14, pick up in verse 16. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see Him or know Him, but you know Him, because He abides with you and will be in you. Again, the Spirit of God. John chapter 16, on the back end of that context, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of Mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine. Therefore, I said that He takes of Mine and will disclose it to you. So again, just like the disciples in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry, if we are going to minister with power, it's only going to be because we're connected to the source of that power. That's the only way. And the source, of course, here, as we've read, is the Spirit of God, Christ working in us and through us. As it was with the disciples in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry, unbelief is a serious problem. It's a serious problem, friends. If we lack confidence in Jesus' ability to work, we really shouldn't expect Him to do anything through us. right? If we lack the confidence that Jesus is able to work today in and through us, we shouldn't really expect that He's going to do anything. The disciples clearly were struggling from unbelief. Now, there are uh, other aspects that we need to consider uh, this morning. Luke 9 shows us what happens when the disciples try to minister with no power. John chapter 15 tells us how they'll have His power after He's gone by abiding in Him through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. So let me raise three concerns that I have this morning about ministering without power. Here's the application for you today. The first one I would call no spirit, no power. No spirit, no power. Now, this should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. I feel compelled to say it every week, actually. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus or turned away from your life of sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you don't have the Spirit of God in you. And so this is the Gospel, gospel 101. No Spirit, no power. So if there is no power, it could be because there's no Spirit of God in you because you've never actually been born again. And so that is something, again, I feel compelled to bring that up week by week. I never know who's, who's listening, uh, either online or in person, who may or may not know the Lord. And if you don't have the Spirit of God in you, then you, don't, you will not minister with power. And so, again, it's the gospel, my friends. Jesus Christ died. We're going to celebrate here in just a, a, a bit the Lord's Supper, a visual depiction, if you will, of that element of the gospel that Jesus Christ died willingly so that sinners could be forgiven and then he rose from the grave. He defeated sin and death. And when he went to be with the Father, he sent that helper, comforter. And if you're in Christ, you have the Spirit of God in you and that's how we can minister with power. So maybe if there's no power to minister ever, it's because you don't know Christ. That's Christ is the answer, friends. I would love to, to speak to you about Jesus more. I'll, I'll be down front in just a moment at the end of the sermon. I'd love to talk and pray with you about faith in Christ if you've never turned from your sin and placed your faith in Jesus. So first one, no spirit, no power. Let me, let me deal with the second one uh, that is abundantly uh, a problem in our day. And I would say this, uh, you could summarize it by saying a total lack of concern for holiness. A total lack of concern for holiness. Previous generations, I'm talking more in the modern era, previous generations often blew it when it came to the topic of holiness because they were far too concerned, in fact, many times they were only concerned about appearing holy. 
appearing holy. That was the, the predominant concern. And so they focused purely on externals to create some sort of uh, appearance and very little on issues of the heart. Now, I'm not saying it's always been that way, but that was definitely a tendency. And so uh, when that happens, when people's primary concern is appearing a certain way, appearing holy, rather than dealing with how things actually are, then you're bound to fall into the trap of legalism. You're going to just arbitrarily start creating rules because you think that's what makes you holy. My friends, that's the way of the Pharisees. Do this, don't do that, don't touch this, don't say this, whatever. I'm not saying we have no standards of behavior, but if we're not dealing with the heart underneath them, then we're just creating arbitrary rules to make us appear holy. And so many times that, that was the way of, of the Pharisees, and it's the way of hypocrisy. It doesn't honor Jesus. It creates stumbling blocks for people outside the church. That's definitely not good. And again, um, I, I've seen and heard much of that from previous generations. But if we are evaluating problems in the here and now, I would say that we're seeing something completely different among professing Christians. It's not some arbitrary uh, concern with the appearance of holiness. Usually now, it's a total lack of concern for holiness at all. It's as if the pendulum has swung full bore. Actually, both are wrong. Uh, both miss the mark. If we're only dealing with externals and saying, well, uh, to be holy means don't smoke cigarettes, don't go to movies, don't go to the store on Sunday, whatever previous generations chose to, to do. And again, I'm not saying all those things are bad. Obviously, I'm not going to advocate smoking cigarettes. But at the same time, if that's your definition of holiness, it's only focused on the externals, that's bad. But now, it's almost like we said, well, we don't want to be that, so let's just go ahead and just punt the idea of holiness throw it out the window, and just all grace, let's just live however we want to, which actually incidentally leaves us on the throne. And so again, we've missed the point altogether. Both approaches miss the mark. The hypocrites of past days cared only about appearing holy, but many in our day don't even try to pretend. They simply live whatever way they want to, often mirroring the culture around them, right? We look like the culture because we don't want to appear like previous generations, holier than now, right? Nobody says that anymore because people don't care about that. My friends, the point is not to appear holy. The point is not to totally abandon holiness. Actually, what Scripture commands is to be holy as I am holy, right? That's what the Scripture says. It seems like it should be obvious to us. 1 Peter chapter 1, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Dedicated to the Lord. Consecrated set apart, pursuing holiness and righteousness. My friends, when we fail to be holy, not just to appear holy, I'm talking about when we fail to be holy, we grieve the Spirit of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. If we consider the context of that verse in Ephesians, Paul is, is exhorting the, the Ephesians to put off all manner of sin and to put on Christ. And so when we abandon the concept of holiness, as we've often done in our day, which is, eh, God's gracious, don't worry about it. Yes, salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ alone, right? Grace alone, faith alone, Christ, I believe every part of that. But someone who's genuinely been transformed by Christ should be living a, or pursuing holiness. That doesn't mean you're going to live it perfectly. People oversimplify issues. The point is this. When we fail to pursue holiness, we grieve the Spirit of God within us. And when we grieve Him, we absolutely should not be expecting to minister in power. It's almost like in the book of Joshua. There's sin in the camp. Sin in the camp. How is it that the Israelites 
cross the Jordan River, they go to Jericho, and God works this powerful, amazing miracle that they march around the city a specified number of times and days, and the walls collapse. It's a, a powerful miracle. And then they, they, they go up to the little podunk village of Ai, and they get routed. How does that happen? Because there was sin in the camp, folks. Be holy as I am holy. That's what God says. Now, I'm quite confident that this subject of holiness is misunderstood by many who sit in church pews or seats every week, week after week. We talk about it, maybe, maybe not, but we don't understand these things. And maybe these are even confusing to you. How can salvation be by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, if we're supposed to do something with respect to our holiness? How can you reconcile those two things? And how does holiness impact our spiritual power? My friends, if that's you, I want to recommend a book for you. Uh, Some of you have read this, maybe been through it. I know I've been through it with a few uh, of our younger men at times over the last couple of years. It's called The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. If you've never read this book, uh, don't just read it, by the way. Uh, Chew on it. it. The Pursuit of Holiness, Jerry Bridges. Uh, We even gave away a copy at the family conference. My friends, we should be pursuing holiness. Uh, One, because it honors Jesus and it's a command of of the Lord. But also, if we want the power to change, not just ourselves, but to see God work around us, we should be pursuing holiness. So why do we lack power? No spirit, no power. Why do we lack power? Because we just abandon the concept of holiness. Let Let me hit a last one here. A third reason why we minister quite often in the modern day with no power is a failure to recognize the spiritual nature of ministry. A failure to recognize the spiritual nature of ministry. The church growth movement was exploded in the 20th century. Um, And it has influenced the thinking of many prominent evangelicals and many who sit in our own pews here in this church. And it's turned ministry into techniques and trends and programs and things that we do. That's what ministry is about. And it greatly neglects the fact that ministry is a spiritual endeavor. It's a spiritual endeavor. You just do these things and man, you're going to see God work and your church is going to grow. Maybe. Maybe not. And even if it does grow... What's actually going on spiritually? Are people really becoming devoted followers of Jesus Christ? Or are they just drawn to charismatic personalities and and programs and events and outstanding music and whatever else things we do to try to spur growth in a church? My friends, there are lots of ministries and churches out there that know how to draw a crowd. But really, all they're doing is using the tools of this world rather than the power of Christ. I'm not body slamming every large church. Don't hear me say that. I'm not saying every big church is bad, and I'm certainly not saying that every small church is good. Don't hear me say that. There are some really solid, Christ-honoring larger churches that God is blessing because they are absolutely ministering in the power of Christ, and God's blessing them in powerful ways. And there are some really horrible, sin-loving small churches that need to go ahead and die so they'll stop dishonoring Jesus and tainting His name. So it's not, I'm not talking about just the size of churches. And to be clear, Pastor Mark and I absolutely pray for and hope that this church grows because we want to see more people come to the Savior. But we want it to be genuine growth empowered by Christ through the Holy Spirit and not because of gimmicks or my own personal charisma. I don't have a lot. But you know what I do have? Jesus. And not just me. So do you. And so do you. And so do you. That's the power of Christ at work in His people. That's what we hope to see. We want to see lives changed and transformed because God is at work here. The power of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying we don't do events. We're doing one tonight. Praise God. I'm not saying we don't do programs. I'm not saying we don't do anything. I'm saying that we have to recognize, my friends, that the power is in Christ and not in the stuff. 
People don't need stuff. They need Jesus. They need Christ. You don't need stuff. We got, we got too much stuff. Honestly, this stuff distracts us from Jesus half the time. This problem isn't new, by the way. The church growth movement may have popularized what I would call ministry in the flesh, but it was going on even in the first century. I read recently in my devotional reading in the book of 1 Corinthians, and the, the church at Corinth was fracturing. Why? Because they were lining up behind their favorite personalities. Remember this? I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. Even some had the boldness to say, well, I am of Christ. Ha ha. <laughs> the ultimate trump card, right? Oh, you can have your Paul and Apollos. I have Jesus. Right. They, they weren't really... Two of, here's what the Apostle Paul says about himself and Apollos. These are two of the primary leaders that people were lining up behind. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. You see, God used Paul and Apollos, and he used Cephas or Peter. He used others. But who made it grow? God did. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. My friend, did you catch that? God is everything. Power of Christ. The Apostle Paul is saying, I, who am I? I'm nothing. Jesus is the one, friends. So let me tie all this together and, and wrap us up this morning. If we're going to minister with power, if we're going to see growth in our own spiritual lives, if we're going to see others impacted by the gospel, then we need Jesus. We need Jesus. We're powerless without Him. So we must know Him or we don't have the Spirit of God within us. We must pursue lives of obedience, of holiness, so we don't grieve the Spirit. And we must recognize that ministry is a spiritual endeavor. And so we pursue ministry in a spirit of dependent prayer with the goal of obedience, motivated by love for God, guided by His Word, and using the spiritual gifts and talents that He's entrusted to us. We must not be enticed by the promise that gimmicks and entertainment and charismatic personalities and fantastic music some of those things maybe are, are, are quite nice, but that's not where the power is, my friends. As I said a moment ago, people don't need stuff. They need Jesus. Jesus. That's who we need. May we be found faithful here. and May people who encounter Rikers Ridge Baptist Church encounter Christ in us. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this lesson in powerlessness. I'm sure at the moment the disciples were, were flabbergasted. Why is it that we had this power and now we can't do anything? And yet Christ exposes their unbelief. Lord, forgive us for our own unbelief, for thinking that the power of, of, of ministry is found in anything other than Jesus. Lord, we do thank you that you use means. You use people. You use all sorts of things to draw us to yourself and to work in us and through us when we're in Christ. And yet, each of those things are, are merely instruments in your hands, as are we. So Lord, we plead with you now to work in us and through us with power that more and more might come to know the hope that's only found in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love for us unworthy sinners, yet you gave us Christ, and because of him we are rich, we have everything. In Jesus, pray this in his name, amen.